All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. I'm, I'm Tyler Williams, a University of Nebraska Extension Educator. I'm located in Lincoln, and I'm hosting the webinar today brought to you by the North Central Climate Collaborative and the North Central Region Water Network. And today we have an excellent webinar. Uh, we have Darren Mueller, Associate Professor with uh, an Extension Plant Pathologist at Iowa State. Uh, he's also the coordinator of the Iowa State University Integrated Pest Management Program. And today he's joining us to talk about how climate impacts corn and soybean diseases, which I suspect there, there may be a connection or two. So we'll be looking forward to that. So, but uh, just before we begin, a couple housekeeping things. Uh, if you've not joined us before, you have a, if you have a question, go ahead and type that into the chat box. Um, I'll kind of monitor that throughout. And if you have something that's pressing, I will go ahead and um, jump in and, and ask that question. If not, we'll, we'll keep most of them to the end. So we'll kind of play that by ear there. Um, also here in a second, I'll pop up a survey question. So you'll see that pop up on your screen and you can just answer those two questions real quick. And then when I see that most everyone has done that, I'll go ahead and take it down. So I'll leave it up for a couple minutes to try to get everyone's responses. And I'll also do the same thing at the end with another question. And, and we do appreciate your response to those surveys. They help us out quite a bit. So um, as a reminder, we do record these webinars and we place them on the, the northcentralclimate.org website. So if you've missed any of them in the past or if you wanna come back and um, go ahead and um, respond to that as well. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Darren and he can go ahead and take it away. Darren, are you able to share your screen? I sure am. All right. The floor is yours. All right. Hopefully everyone can see the slides and they can hear me all right. Yeah, I think so. Good. All Good. right. So like Tyler said, my name is Darren Mueller. I am at Iowa State University in the Extension and then also in the Plant Pathology Department. Uh, today's talk, it, it is a little bit vague. It's, it's a tough topic to cover, actually, as, as I was diving through the literature. Uh, obviously, uh, I think low-hanging fruit would be that climate change can impact field crop diseases. So, spoiler alert, yes, it, it can. But to try to get all of that organized into, into a, a slide set, it, um, it became, it, 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 it was an interesting path to get these slides done. So, all right. I'm going to, all right, so just as a, a really big overview, and I think that none of this should be a surprise on the, on the first slide here, is that changing weather will not only affect the plant pathogens and insects and weed species, but it, um, to really to start with, climate change will affect, or climate uh, and changing weather will affect the corn and soybean growth and development. And so there's gonna be this theme going through throughout this talk is, we're, we're, we're trying to look at this holistically, not, not only is climate change directly affecting the pathogens, and we'll, we'll outline uh, that, those examples uh, in, in more detail, but also it's affecting uh, how farmers are growing corn and soybean, and, and not only that, the corn and soybean uh, growth and development. And so you'll sort of see this theme throughout. Um, anybody that has listened to a plant, listened to a plant pathology talk, um, there's, Really, you really have to have a, a, a plant disease triangle in it. And so uh, for those that are not familiar with plant pathology, to get disease, you have to have the right environment um, sort of in, in place when you have a, a susceptible host plant and, and then a pathogen that can cause disease. And so when all three of these things are in place at the same time, that's when you get plant disease. And really the whole talk is going to be centered around uh, this triangle and, and these three components. And as far as how is climate change affecting these three different uh, aspects of the triangle. So we're gonna start with environment, uh, since it is a, a climate change talk, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of the detail. You guys, most of the people on this call probably know the, the finer details as to what changes are actually happening, but from a plant pathologist perspective, the things that we are focusing on would be the increase in temperatures, um, and then the more extreme weather conditions, weather events, uh, heavier rainfalls, um, more, more hail damage, et cetera. And then also more rainfall in, in parts of the Midwest, especially um, the, these heavier rainfalls that, that we've been seeing. And so uh, some of the challenges, uh, again, from a plant pathology perspective would be um, uh, drought and flooding, which are obviously uh, opposites, but we, you know, uh, they can be affecting diseases. And then salinity and heat, we're not gonna go into uh, those two as much, but 
certainly these are these are just sort of abiotic stresses that we see as plant pathologists that may be affecting uh, the the overall disease port, uh, profile that's out there. So really, when you're talking about diseases, the two environmental factors that are the driving factors would be uh, temperature and moisture. And so uh, when we look at how diseases develop, a lot of these are going to be fungi or bacteria and, and both fungi and bacteria, for the most part, there's a, there are exceptions, uh, they like moisture. And then um, usually, I, I always tell people if, if a, a fungus, if, if you're out on a golf course or in a fishing boat or doing something that you enjoy doing, and you're not either freezing or sweating, the temperature is probably appropriate for a fungus to be growing. They, they usually have a pretty broad range of temperatures that, that uh, they can grow in. As we get into the 90s or we get into sort of consistent, really uh, warmer days or hot days, uh, you can see some diseases starting to taper off. And we'll, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but not only that, so, so there are some diseases out there that we're starting to select for that are directly related to extreme weather events. And I'll, the next three slides will go over sudden death syndrome, charcoal rot, and then physoderma, those are on soybeans, and then physoderma brown spot on corn. Uh, what we have pictured here is white mold. That's one that I'm not gonna talk about, but that would be another one where as, as we get uh, increased moisture, there certainly uh, are areas in, in the Midwest that are seeing more and more white mold uh, these last few years. So we're going to go with start with sudden death syndrome. This is one that is on soybeans. Uh, it is now the number one soybean fungal disease as far as yield loss and the impact on soybean uh, yields across the, the north central states or really across the U.S. It is, there's, it's not as common as, as you get outside of the Midwest, but um, it is still a, a major disease in most of the soybean growing areas. Uh, this disease, although it's called sudden death syndrome, it's a little bit of a misnomer because it actually infects just within a couple of days or a week after planting. So it, it's just like any other root, root rot pathogen that can, it can cause, uh, and figure, it can infect the, the seedlings very, very early in the season. And then what happens is, is that this fungus will sort of hang out in those root systems and then it'll wait for the reproductive stages. It'll start to produce a toxin and then that toxin gets translocated to the top of the plant. And that's when you see these characteristic yellowing and, and um, death between the veins. You're going to see, so this is going to be one of those diseases that if you get a really heavy rainfall in those uh, early to mid reproductive stages, uh, the, this disease, if the pathogen's in the field, this disease can really take off. And then yields for this disease are, are really going to be impacted. This is a pretty patchy disease for most years in most fields. Uh, and yields are going to be, can be really dramatically reduced in these patches, not just from the foliar symptoms, but also from the root rot symptoms. So it's really hitting that plant uh, with these two different phases. All right, charcoal rot's another one. And this is just sort of give an example on the other side. This is a disease that actually is more problematic in the hot dry seasons. And so, um, and again, just like SDS, it is going to be, uh, it occurs in patches. And, and within those patches, you can see in that top right uh, picture, you can have, you're going to have plants that are completely defoliated and, and die off very, very prematurely. And so you can have yields significantly reduced in, in these patches. And there are some fields and in some years where those patches will unfortunately sort of cover more of the field than, than uh, the healthy parts of the field. So this was a quote that I saw in uh, one, of the, one of the United Soybean Board proposals that was submitted a couple years ago. But you know, as we're looking at more extreme weather events in, in the future, including gr drier growing seasons, um, it's expected that the incidence and severity of charcoal rot will in continue to increase in the north central region. And this is, um, Kirsten Wise was the, the lead PI on this proposal with the United Soybean Board at the time. So. This is a disease that you can see these little, on, on the bottom picture, you can see these little microsclerotia. They'll grow inside um, the stem and in, in the vascular tissue and clog up that vascular tissue and, and really, really uh, hinder the, the plant's ability to move nutrients and water in, in that plant. And so uh, just two extreme examples, one too, too, too much water, one too little water, and, and there's a disease that's sort of ready for, for either condition. 
On the corn side, uh, I sort of highlighted an up and coming disease. This is Physoderma brown spot. Uh, this is one that we're seeing really an, an uptake in the last five years or so. Um, and this is one that um, is, is directly related to having heavy rainfalls very early in the season. And so the way this pathogen infects is that actually you have to have water in the whirl. And then if you have, so if you have a lot of rainfall and you have a lot of standing water inside that whirl, um, the spores will need that water to, to sort of swim over and then um, and, and, and infect the corn plant. A lot of times, if you look at this, the, the picture in the middle, you can see these sort of bands going across the, the leaf. This is going to, the spores actually need light as well. And so uh, you sort of see this day night pattern of, of, of growth um, and, and infection. And a lot of these, it's, uh, it's a pretty easy disease to diagnose. It has these chocolate brown or, or dark brown spots that are in the midrib and then really small little spots that, that are in these bands going across the leaf. So, Again, just a disease that really needs saturated soils and a lot of free water very early in the season, which is what would favor this disease. So now I'm gonna shift your attention away from just specific diseases and then how they're being affected by environment. One of the other things that we look at as plant pathologists is what agronomic practices are changing as the environment's changing as well. And sort of the trends that we're seeing uh, would be earlier planting, uh, and then also people, uh, the farmers are, are going to narrow or row, sp row spacing or perhaps even higher plant populations where they're trying to capture and, and uh, capture more, more of that sunlight early in the season. Um, but then there's other ones, and, you know, and, and these, these are related to uh, climate change, but they're also related to just sort of the external uh, pressures that farmers are facing as far as trying to uh, preserve the resources that we have. So there's more reduced tillage out there a lot of farmers are considering or using cover crops. And then also there's a, a push at trying to improve water management. And so um, adjusting tiling, going, going to sort of a monitor tiling or uh, some, of, some of the work there. And so all of those things could be affecting the environments within a field. I'm just gonna highlight, and, and what that can do would be, it could, you know, as, as you close that canopy, you know, that's a sort of the microenvironment that's gonna increase the humidity that's gonna favor foliar diseases. Um, it, as you have more soil moisture, uh, that, that can certainly affect uh, root rot pathogens, um, reduce tillage and, and, and cover crops. So these, these can be affecting the survival of the amount of the pathogens or insects that are out in the field or the attractiveness of, of certain insects to, to a field. And then also these, all of these would be maybe affecting uh, weed pressure and, and some pathogens can survive um, on weeds as well. So I'm just going to highlight uh, one of the one of these, and that's cover crops. And this is a, a study that was done by Allison Robertson's lab at, at Iowa State University, where they're looking at winter rye cover crops and corn seedling diseases. And so what you see in the picture would be uh, corn on your far left, corn three days uh, terminated three days before planting, and then eight days before planting, 17 days before planting, and then that last arrow is, is the strip that had no rye uh, as, as the control. And then what they would do, they plant the corn and then they go in and start looking at uh, the amount of root rot. And the root rot that we're looking at is Pythium root rot. And uh, if you can see then there were more treatments than what was in that picture. But if you look at this graph, uh, the no rye, uh, the corn that was grown in no rye had about, had less than 10% of the roots with, with a little bit of disease or some disease. And the 25 days before and 17 days before uh, were in that 25% of, of the roots had, had some Pythium root rot. And then everything after that, eight days before, three days before, and two days after, uh, you're looking at 80% or more of the roots having some root rot. What does that look like when, when, a, when a plant pathologist says it has root rot? This is a good picture of it. Uh, the, the corn plants on the left-hand side are going to be the ones three days before planting. Uh, so by root rot, we mean having these uh, blackened, rotted parts of that root they are gonna be stunted or smaller, and then the, the seedlings are gonna be just a little bit uh, smaller, less vigorous um, than, than when you have healthy, uh, non-rotted roots that you'd see on, on the right-hand side. All right, so the, those are some of the, and, and there's other agronomic practices that are changing 
um, either in direct response to some of the cli uh, climate change, those are some of the ones that came off the top of my uh, plant pathologist's head. Uh, but some of those changes also would be in pest management practices. And so as we plant earlier, we might have more seed treatments, for example. And then not only are there more, you know, like corn soy, corn soy has been treated or has been for a long time, but soybeans are now being treated more often, but there's more seed treatment options out there. There's nematicides, there's um, you know, a, a, a slew of other products that are, end up on these roots. We're seeing an increase in foliar fungicide use, and this is you know in the last 10, 15 years, and so it's not completely recent, but uh, some of this is going to be in response, and you'll see it in a couple slides, to, to some of the foliar diseases that are now present in the North Central region. Um, and then we have things that are sort of becoming full circle, where we have seed treatment issues associated with honeybees, and we're starting to see, uh, like up in Canada, there's some restrictions on on uh, you know neonics being used in, in field crops, and so there, what are the consequences of us maybe losing some of these products that we're using? Uh, certainly, herbicide resistant weeds. We can have herbicide, or we can have insect insecticide resistant insects that are that are becoming more and more prevalent. And what shifts are we doing um, to to sort of deal with those? And so, uh, like in the herbicide resistant weeds, one of the more common conversations uh, I hear between some of the older farmers and, and, and they're handing them down to the next generation would be the next generation wants to go back to narrow rows to try to deal with the herbicide resistant weeds, which is going to be one of the, the best ways to increase the amount of white mold, especially for the people in Wisconsin and Minnesota and in, in the Dakotas. And so, uh, you know, there, there's just this sort of ongoing battle with some of these decisions. Um, and then the last bullet, bullet point is bio-based uh, pesticides. Certainly something that we're keeping an eye on, um, again, probably not re directly related to climate change, uh, but you know, there's a products that are, that are becoming available for a, a lot of different uh, purposes and uh, these can be affecting uh, the, the environment out there as well. So that's sort of a broad picture of environment, not only affecting the direct impact, the, the, the moisture or the temperature out in a field or out in a region, but also sort of the, the changing agronomic practices that might be affecting the, the diseases in a, in a sort of a smaller uh, influence in, in, within those fields. The next corner that we're gonna be talking about is the pathogen, sort of how does environment or climate change affect uh, the pathogen. I'm including some of the insects in here as well, so apologies to any of the entomologists that, that may be talking if, if you're invited uh, before or after me, but, um, there's certainly things that, that, that we have noticed, and, and there's, so one of them would be soybean gall midge. Um, and then on the disease side, uh, bacterial leaf streak in corn and tar spot in corn. Um, are these related to climate? You know, that's still to be determined. There's certainly uh, some belief that some of these diseases are moving in on some of these, on some of these storms uh, coming out of Central America. You know, why that didn't happen previously and it's happening now there's still a lot of aerobiology uh, that, that's need, that needs to be sorted out, but um, certainly we're seeing, it, uh, we continue to see new or invasive uh, uh, diseases and insects. Some of the diseases or insects have actually gone down, so it's not always bad. Uh, we're seeing, if you look at 20 years ago, one of the major diseases that we'd see in, in seed corn would be Stewart's wilt. That's one that we, you know, has uh, phytosanitary concerns and it's one that we keep a close eye on. It's transmitted by the corn flea beetle. One of the beliefs is that, uh, you know, as we started treating a lot of our corn with insecticide seed treatment, this is one of the insects that was uh, either going away or were starting to show up a little bit later and, and we would see uh, less and less of Stewart's wilt. So sort of a unintended consequence, good consequence that we'd see less and less of this disease as, as we moved into more and more insecticide seed treatments. Um, so if we start losing those again, uh, that would, this is certainly a disease that we're, we're going to keep an eye on to see, if, to see if it starts coming back. And then what I'm going to be highlighting in the next couple of slides would be some of these uh, pathogens are simply becoming more and more common. Uh, the pathogens that are more commonly associated with, uh, with the South or the Mid-South, we're starting to see in, in the Midwest either earlier and, and or much more frequently. And these examples would be Southern rust, for anybody that hadn't seen southern rust, if you just walked out in any cornfield in the Midwest uh, this this last year or this last month, uh, you, you could have found southern rust in, in, in that field. 
and then frog eye leaf spot in soybeans. And then also, uh, on, I'll, I'll talk about this in a couple slides, would be an increase in some of the viral or virus diseases. All right, so I'm not going to go over, the, over southern rust, but um, we are going to talk about frog eye leaf spot. And this is one, again, it's, it's been associated mostly with and, and with the south, the deep south, and or the mid south, Tennessee, uh, Missouri, uh, to the sort of that, that swath there. Um, and if you look at some of the data, we actually, um, I'll have a, 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 a link to this on, on the last slide, but we, we have a new calculator out in the Crop Protection Network where we can go back and look at the historic disease data from, nine, you know, from, from 1996 on. And if you look at the first five years of it, on average, frog eye in the Midwestern states lost about 460,000 bushels uh, a year collectively in those states, which equated out to about four cents an acre. So if you're looking at the economic impact of frog eye back in the 1996 to 2000, it was, it was very, very small. If you look at 2013 to 2017, the last five years we have uploaded into that calculator, uh, we have seven, on average around 7.6 million bushels lost per year in, in the Midwestern states, which equates out to $1.15 uh, $1 per acre. So uh, you can see this is just a very dramatic increase uh, in frog eye uh, just in, in these Midwestern states over these last five years. And so frog eye, to, to manage frog eye, uh, you know, the deep south and mid-south, they have a lot of varieties that are resistant. And there's a lot of resistance genes that are out there that have already been overcome, but there are some out there that, that have not been, and they're, and they're uh, still holding up and, and still look pretty good. But, you know, over the last, you know, 10 years, soybean breeders now have to start breeding this frog eye resistance into varieties that are uh, groups threes, group twos, group ones, and, and in, into areas or regions that they typically haven't had to deal with frog eye leaf spot. Now, now it's something that's is very apparent if you walk around in fields in Iowa that if you have a susceptible uh, variety to frog eye leaf spot, you, you know it. And if, if you would have said that same thing, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it, it, you, could, you could have gotten away with not using a resistant variety. It's also, and this would be the back to that bullet point a couple slides ago, it is on one of the, the main, or if not the main one, it's one of the top targets for foliar fungicides and soybeans in the U.S. And so uh, if you start looking at uh, fung foliar fungicide use and, and the increase in foliar fungicide use, there's a lot of different uh, aspects to it. Um, but, the, you know, one, one of, one of the um, targets or one of the reasons why we are seeing an increase is because of this disease alone. All right, so now we're going to uh, sort of do another one-off where we start looking at insects and climate and temperature uh, uh, different from diseases, where it's temperature and moisture in the insect world is mostly temperature. And so um, if you start looking at, I'm just going to pull out two examples. We have soybean aphids pictured here. We have soybean thrips pictured here. Um, you know, they're going to be completely different for, uh, for both of these insects. If you look at thrips, um, th these are going to respond uh, positively to yeast. Uh, to heat and drought, uh, and so I think the the ideal temperature for for thrips uh, and thrips reproduction is, you know, in that in the 80s, mid 80s uh, uh, degrees Fahrenheit, um, and but they also like very very dry conditions, and so we had a lot of thrips, uh, especially soybean thrips, um, present in 2012 and then the early part of 2013 when that when that drought or the drier conditions continued, and then on the soybean aphid side. You're looking at uh, an insect that is going to be negatively responding to higher temperatures, and this is some of the data out of um, Brian McCormick's lab, where they are looking at, uh, you know, the the lifespan of an aphid is, you know, it, it continues to decrease as the temperatures go up. In fact, if you get up in the 95 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you know, that the aphids will completely die, um, and then you can see the same thing, sort of the the, the amount of reproduction and and the, and the doubling time. Um, is going to go down as you as the temperatures increase. And so, why does that matter in the plant pathology world? Again, if you dive into some of the literature back in the um, you know mid '90s to 2000s, the, the number one and two soybean viruses that were mentioned were bean pod monovirus and soybean mosaic virus. And, and we're not—I didn't have a slide on bean leaf beetles, but you know, um, soybean aphids are the are the vector for soybean mosaic virus. 
Uh, and, and then in the last five years, 2013 to 2017, we've had outbreaks of several different viruses, including soybean vein necrosis virus, tobacco ring spot, ring spot virus, and tobacco streak virus. All three of these are transmitted by thrips. And so, again, there's other factors that are involved. There's uh, looking at you know seed, seed issues, um, and and um, and then and the drier temperatures, but really climate is playing a role as far as having having these flushes of thrips or soybean thrips specifically uh, over these last couple of years. All right, so the highlight pathogens we, we can have a, a you know climate can have a direct impact on uh, you know the the pathogen and the growth of the pathogen, but it can also have an effect on the vectors, like like we mentioned here. And so there's there's a lot of different uh, things to be considered. The last part we're going to be talking about is the plant. It's having a susceptible or a, a plant that's sort of ripe for for disease to develop on it. And so um, when I talk to the breeders to prepare for this, you know, a lot, a lot of them would be saying that you know breeding efforts are continuing to are continuing to target diseases and and abiotic stresses such as temperature and water. Uh, certainly a lot of these uh, breeding efforts, there's the classic ones, and, but then there's also a lot of these are being complemented by, by biotechnology. And if you know, you can have, have a long list, I, I, I kept asking them what, what traits are, are coming out. And people were always looking for higher yields and increasing yields, but some of these now are being, we're finding some genes that are very specific for yield and, and that we're used, starting to use biotechnology. Nitrogen use efficiency, a lot of herbicide resistance that's available both in corn and soybean, um, a lot of resistance in uh, pathogen and insect pest, and and this is includes some of the biggies like soybean cyst nematode, um, so soybean aphids. There's a lot of resistance that, that's being developed, but then there's also plants that are now being targeted for some of these stresses to sort of make them more resilient: um, drought and heat tolerance, cold frost tolerance. Um, and then the last one is sort of going after some of these niche markets where you're going to increase feed efficiency, um, it perhaps increase the fatty acid profile or the protein content. So you're starting to look at producing seeds that are, that are targeting a very specific um, uh, market that's out there. All of that being said is because uh, anytime you release new traits, you are increasing the chances of maybe introducing genetics that are going to be more susceptible susceptible to diseases. And you can look historically at all of the major outbreaks of corn and soybean diseases in the last 10, 15, 20 years, and they're most likely going to be targeted or going to be traced back to a seed company that released a very susceptible or more susceptible lines for Goss's wilt, for northern corn leaf blight, for gray leaf spot, for frog eye leaf spot. Whatever the disease is, a lot of times they're going to be re, um, introduced. And the graph that you see on the right is uh, a study done actually out of Mississippi, but I, I, we have similar data from, from Wisconsin on white mold, uh, where we're looking at southern stem canker, where they saw a 45% increase when they started releasing the Roundup Ready to extend beans and comparing them uh, to, the, to the existing ones that, that were out there, the Roundup Ready to, to yield ones. And so as they release this new trait, a lot of times because they're not necessarily, that trait's not necessarily directly related to diseases, uh, you, that possibility is there to be introducing uh, more susceptible genetics. And so anytime we see new, new traits being released for whatever it is, uh, that's the, what's one of the things that plant pathologists look at is sort of, sort of that oh crap moment where we're trying to figure out, okay, what, what diseases may be affected um, by, by this release. And for the most part, breeders are trying to drag and are trying to include, um, you know, multiple diseases and pests and stress uh, resistance or tolerance uh, with all of those releases. But it, this just increases those chances uh, of it happening where, where somehow more susceptible uh, lines slip, sort of slip through. And so, you know, we, we I, I mean, this is, this is true uh, in ongoing breeding efforts really in, in the industry or in the universities is that, you know, there's this, we're trying to study that interaction of the host plant 
with, with the environment in the presence of disease. And so it's really trying to hit that disease triangle to make sure that they're not getting escapes when they're really evaluating that those genetics uh, sort of in the, in the best conditions possible. The next one is really new crops. And so, you know, we, we've been called more and more often on looking at uh, the, you know, what else is out there besides corn soybean. And you know, one of the things, just as an example, this is just one that came you know, across my desk last week, was mung beans are, are going to be more drought tolerant uh, than, than a lot of the crops that are out there. And it's also could be one of the protein sources for plant-based plant -based burgers. And so, um, you know, we may be seeing an increase in a diversification of, of crops that are out there um, as long as the market drives that. And then as you do that, you're gonna be introducing that, going back to that triangle, you're gonna be introducing a whole new set of pathogens. And some of those might overlap with corn soybean. Um, and again, it might be in, in this changing environment. And so really uh, just, just changes in the existing crops and, and, and the traits that are out there, but then also we could be looking at new crops as well. All right, so this is my summary slide. And so really, Climate change does affect diseases and insects, but really uh, all of these bubbles are, I, I could have spent a little bit more time on this and just drawn arrows across all of them, but uh, climate change is going to be affecting, it's gonna be really be driving some of the technologies that are being produced. Um, it's gonna be affecting pest management practices, agronomic practices, perhaps uh, new genetics or new crops that are out there. It could be affecting the economics and the economic decisions that are being made uh, or directly affecting the insect pests and, and diseases um, that, that we see present in the field. And so, and all of these are sort, are, are gonna be related um, at, at some point or some level in, within that disease triangle. So with that, uh, if you wanted more information, again, I, I talked about that calculator earlier. That's under cropprotectionnetwork.org. If you go to the resources page, uh, there is a calculator uh, that, that's present. Um, and, and there's a lot more information on, on Crop Protection Network, uh, on, on corn, soybean, wheat diseases uh, for really across the Midwest. And so uh, with that, I welcome any questions or comments. Okay, yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and type them into the chat box. I'm gonna pop up the last poll question there and you can see that um, before you sign off. But uh, like I said, go ahead, jump in, type into the chat box if you have some questions. Um, I know I have, a, I have one, Darren, while people are thinking. Um, you showed that, that research of cover crops and killing date. Um, I wonder, you know, what, what considerations do they have to think about what type of cover crop they put in there? and you know how that might make a difference in disease carryover or even disease susceptibility based off of the different types of mixes and all the cocktails or even you know just single species mixes i didn't know if you had any right. um any suggestions or comments on that yeah it's, i would say that is sort of the ongoing part we i know my lab and then a couple of other labs look at it on the soybean side where we're looking at a lot of different uh a lot of different cover crops, especially the legume ones, because we thought there'd be sort of that green bridge between those and soybeans. We didn't really see it in soybeans. Um, in, in the corn world, that's, that's where we have more problems uh, with pythium moving from rye to, to corn. I would say uh, as, if you shifted away to other things, that would certainly could affect what pythiums are there, but there's a lot of different pythium species within each field. And a lot of that, and I think regardless of what you had, you could probably be selecting for something that's out there, would be my guess. Okay, thanks. Uh, we do have one question so far. Um, Emily asks if there is any information on yield loss changes in the past few years from southern rust moving north earlier. So the plant pathologist as a group, they will actually collect uh, disease loss estimates across the U.S. And, they, and they'll post those on Crop Protection Network. And so um, I don't know if 2018 is posted or not, uh, but in general, um, especially this year, uh, we, we saw an increase. The last couple of years, it's been probably coming in late enough. Maybe, maybe Nebraska and some of those places have had a little bit more than, than normal. 
but it came in late enough where it wasn't a huge pr problem. I would say this is the first year where I, I've seen a real um, possibility for it to be reducing yield. All right, another question from Carla. Um, for tar spot, can it be controlled with currently used uh, foliar fungicides? Sure. I, I would say um, it is It is a fungus, and right, as of now, I think it, they're all pretty sensitive to some of the products. There's a couple of good data sets out of Michigan and, and uh, Wisconsin that, have, that look at specific products, and I would say uh, get your hands on those. I, I'm going to keep dragging it back to Crop Protection Network. We will ha we have a fungicide efficacy table on there as well, uh, and so you can go there, find tar spot, and we don't have a lot of data because it, it's new enough, uh, but we do see some differences in, in, in some of those fungicide products. So, okay, thanks. Got another one from Nancy. Are there changes in rotations or co-cropping or interseeding strategies that could reduce any of these issues? Yes. Um, the, the example off the top of my head is it, that we, we've shown that if you had a more complicated uh, rotation system outside of corn soybean, you can certainly reduce SDS uh, the, the, as an example. Um, you know, we just haven't, we haven't seen people adopting that or, uh, you know, for, for, for all the other external reasons, economics, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's certainly, if you, if you, if you added more crops into your system, I think that in general, um, that would be, I think uh, this is probably an overstatement, but in general, we, we've selected for a lot of the pathogens over the last 30 years that, that can be problematic to, in a corn soybean rotation. So as you rotate away from that, um, it certainly will help manage those diseases. Okay, thanks. Got a, um... Another question here, uh, any potential upside to cover crop use in a changing climate, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in response to insects or pests, or is it all bad news there as far as, you know, we talk a lot about in the climate world of utilizing cover crops, uh, but right. we also talk with producers about all of the, the secondary impacts that come with that. And so, you know, if you had any other, any positive maybe from the pest or disease side that. You know, we've looked because <laughs> it's, you know, so we, I would say there's one example that we haven't ruled out, and that would be white mold. There's some research that's been done out of Wisconsin back in the 90s that, that saw a reduction in white mold when they planted wheat um, and, then, and then came in with soybeans uh, afterwards. And that, because what you're doing is you're actually just creating a barrier, and so the, the pathogen will germinate and produce little mushrooms um, in the soil, and those mushrooms produce the spores. If you can block that with residue you that that might be a way and so so a good thick uh cover crop canopy could be similar to that uh, you know the the wheat crop that was growing back in, in wisconsin that, that showed that so there are certainly possibilities we we've tried to to research that specifically but every year we do uh, we don't get white mold and so um we're, we're going to continue to look at that one uh, my lab looks at soybean diseases and to be honest we keep trying to either make diseases worse or better with cover crops. And in general, we see nothing, which I guess is a positive uh, where, where cover crops can just do what they're supposed to be doing and you're not making diseases better or worse. Um, and, we, and we've looked at a lot of them. So we've looked at a lot of pythiums, a lot of fusarium, SDS, uh, charcoal rot. We looked at, we looked at a lot of different diseases and, and none of them seem to care that the cover crop was there or not there. So. Okay, got another question from uh, Danell, and uh, she says, as an ag economist, she, uh, she learned a lot. But the question is, is there any interaction between a crop variety's growing season requirement, like a short season versus long season, uh, and their susceptibility to pests or diseases? Because she mentioned she's been thinking a lot about um, short season varieties as an adaptation to these wet springs and falls that we've had that have been challenging on the planting and harvesting. So. Didn't know if that, at, that adaptation had any side effects, good or bad, on pests and diseases. Well, um, that's a good question. I, I think, you know, as breeding efforts intensify for some of the, you know, growing crops further and further north, and you're starting to see, you know, a lot of soybeans growing up in North Dakota now, millions and millions of acres, 
and and having that ability to still still get really high yields in these short seasons, I, I think that that is certainly um, a, a possibility. In fact, plant pathologists are starting to look at that a little bit. I, I, I can't give you specific examples off the top of my head, but um, you know, one of the ways that we try to manage diseases is, is avoidance. And so, if you can uh, plant a crop that is shorter season, and and you can sort of miss out on uh, the early season r bad, bad planting conditions or get your crop out of the ground while some of these foliar diseases intensify in, in late August and September and you can avoid that, um, that, that certainly uh, would be a possibility. Okay, thanks. I got uh, one more here, it looks like, oh, maybe two. Uh, your comments seem to lean towards shifts in IPM pressures not increasing issues with climate change. Is that your assessment or do you think there are increasing issues in any of the disease or insect realm? Um, I would say that I don't know how to answer that one. I, I would say that some of the foliar diseases that we're seeing, I'm gonna stick with foliar diseases, some of them there are more of them, but I, and but some of that might be, um, you know, like a frog eye, for example, we definitely see more of that. But some of the other diseases, we see more of that just because we're out looking for it a little bit more. So I don't know if it's necessarily us evolving as, as scouts and then as plant pathologists and, and having a better idea of what's actually out there versus we didn't, you know, soybeans were truly considered just the rotational crop that you just suffered through before you get to your next corn crop. And so we didn't spend a lot of time looking in them. And so, but, but as yields are increasing and corn prices are, are, are suffering, you know, you spend a little bit more time managing soybeans. So it's hard to tease that apart. I would say, you know, and, and there are certainly diseases out there like soybean systematode that um, really have not increased its impact on yield. If you look at the, you know, the 96 to 2000, and then the last five years from that disease loss calculator, the you know the yield losses that we were seeing, you know, ha have really flattened out you know, with with soybean systematode. So I don't know. I mean, there's so it's, there's so many complicating factors there. I would say my gut instinct would be that um, the the cultural practices and and the changes in genetics drive diseases more than than climate at this point. Okay. Uh, another question here. Uh, this one's from Todd. Um, it says a soybean grower in Georgia who has grown 200 plus bushel per acre soybeans claims that he benefits from preventative fungicide applications. If we are getting more movement of southern U.S. issues in the Midwest, do you believe that there will be renewed interest in preventative fungicide applications? Uh, do these possible applications impede AMF but, uh, beneficial fungi development in the soil? So I thought, I thought the yields were 196 is what he got, not over 200. But um, I would say that uh, I'll, I'll use Iowa as an example, and I'll just stick into the state I know the best. I would say in Iowa, a lot of the fields that I walked into this year had enough frog eye to warrant a foliar fungicide spray, preventative or not. And so, um, you know, it, as people are out scouting and looking for diseases in a year like this, where we have a lot of southern rust coming and, and, and frog eye and, and soybean, um, there, there really could have been a benefit of, of foliar fungicides um, in a lot more acres that, that, that were not sprayed. Um, if it's preventative or not, um, hopefully they're doing their homework and they're, and they're spraying them on the ones that are more susceptible, et cetera. But, you know, I, I have my doubts. But um, I would say that my viewpoint is foliar fungicides are an important tool. Hopefully we don't lose them. And I would, I mean, there's, there's definitely a role there for protecting yield uh, all, all the way up into the Midwest. Sort of skirted the answer there a little bit. <laughs> That's all right. That's good. Um, I don't know if, it, I don't know if you addressed the second part on the AMF beneficial fungi development in the soil. 
or not, or if that's the part you skirted. Yeah, I, I am going to stay away from that one. I, I mean, there's certainly, there's consequences to everything that's sprayed on in the field. And so uh, but I, I don't, I don't know the literature well enough to, to know how that would be affected. So. Okay. Yeah. One more here from Carla. It says, uh, looking ahead 10 to 15 years, which disease is most concerning for you? Um, in corn, I would say it would be, uh, a, a lot of the, any, anything that can produce a mycotoxin. I think that, uh, with a lot of, and I didn't really go into a lot of the details there, but you know, the, the animal science industry is begging for us plant pathologists to figure out a, lo a lot of the mycotoxins that are, that are occurring and, and accumulating in silage or in grain. Uh, the pig industry has suffered from, from increases in that the last several years. And that's something that with increased moisture, that's, that, that's not going away. Um, and then on the soybean side, uh, you know, the, the lowest hanging fruit there would probably be frog eye leaf spot. You know, right now the best sources of resistance or the best ways to manage it would be resistance, which is a single gene. And a lot of the fungicides that are being used, we've already lost one class of fungicides, the QOIs, the strobe um, And within, you know, the first five years, and we're, we're putting a lot of selection pressure on some of the other classes uh, now that we've already lost one. So I'd say in the next 10 to 15 years, frog eye is going to be sort of an increasing pain, pain in our butt, so. Okay, uh, I don't have any more questions. So we had a number of good ones there. So that was, uh, was good, it was a good conversation. So I think that's all we have. So um, thanks Darren, I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us and uh, thanks everyone for, for joining in and participating. And like I said, this can be found at northcentralclimate.org I know you can see there's uh, some information there from Darren um, to contact him if you have any follow-up questions. So uh, that's it from us. So I'll go ahead and stop the recording.